شروع اللہ کا نام لے کر جو بڑا مہربان نہایت رحم والا ہے اے نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ وسلم ہم نے تم کو کوثر یعنی بہت زیادہ بھلائی عطا فرمائی ہے تو اپنے پروردگار کے لیے نماز پڑھا کرو اور قربانی کیا کرو کچھ شک نہیں کہ تمہارا دشمن ہی بے نام رہے گا Honorable guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good morning. I'm Amina Rafiq and I'm on behalf of the Poland Disarmament Center at the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad. I welcome you all to a seminar on 25 years of Yom-e Takbir, promoting peace. Ladies and gentlemen, first I would request Director Arms Control and Disarmament Center, Malik Qasim Mustafa, for his introductory remarks. بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈسٹنگ اسپیکرس ڈاکٹر انصر پرویز فارمر چیئرمین آف پاکستان اٹامک انرجی کمیشن اینڈ مسٹر محمد کامران اختر ایڈیشنل سیکرٹری ایکڈس پی 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 ڈی موفا اینڈ وی اسپیشل تھینکس ٹو لیفٹینٹ جنرل خالد کدوائی ایڈوائزر نیشنل کمانڈ اتھارٹی اینڈ فارمر ڈائریکٹر جنرل اسٹریٹجک پلان ڈویژن فار از میسج آن دس Occasion, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. My name is Qasim Mustafa and I'm director at the Arms Control and Disarmament Center at the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad. And on behalf of the center and the institute, I warmly welcome you all to this seminar to commemorate 25 years of yom e takbir promoting peace, stability, and development. <laughs> Dear participants, as we all know that since May 28, 1998, the Pakistani nation every year proudly commemorates yom takbir as a day which has not only augmented Pakistan's national security, but it has ensured its survival against aggression by a large and more powerful adversary, India. This day is marked in the history as a day when Pakistan, by conducting nuclear weapons tests, restored the balance of power in the South Asian region. Since then, Pakistan has embarked upon a path to safeguard its freedom by maintaining peace and ensuring stability with restraints and responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years, Pakistan faced several challenges and hurdles, but it performed as a responsible nuclear power. These challenges include the fragility of South Asian strategic stability due to the Indian actions and intentions, India's ongoing nuclear and military modernization drive to achieve great power status, India's shifting nuclear and conventional warfighting doctrine and postures, and selective international discrimination not allowing Pakistan to do international trade for peaceful purposes. However, Pakistan made every effort to overcome these challenges and hurdles and achieved progress in its respective domains. Pakistan has developed a robust command and control structure, implemented stringent export control laws, rules, and regulations, and established a national nuclear safety and security regime. All these steps are in line with the international law and best practices. Dear participants, ensuring comprehensive human security, economic security, energy security, food security, and environmental security are vital for a prosperous community. In this regard, Pakistan is making use of peaceful nuclear technology in almost all sectors, including energy, agriculture, industry, medicine, environment, and other related areas to bring prosperity and growth. However, better utilization of peaceful nuclear technology requires resources and international cooperation. Pakistan has already built a roadmap and a strong case for international cooperation to access the latest peaceful nuclear technology for growth and development and comprehensive human security. Ladies and gentlemen, 
while keeping in mind some of these above aspects and the importance of this day. The ACDC has organized this seminar not only to commemorate Jom e Takbir, but also to look at this day as an opportunity to assess Pakistan's nuclear journey of, a promo of promoting peace, stability, and development by exploring these key elements. Number one, how in the past 25 years Pakistan performed the role of a responsible nuclear power by pursuing restraint and responsibility. Number two, how Pakistan has used this technology for peaceful purposes and socioeconomic development. And number three, how our diplomacy played a role to convince the international community in maintaining a balance between our legitimate security needs and responsible nuclear behavior. I hope that our distinguished panelists could share their views on some of these aspects and help us assess where we stand after 25 years and what is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would now request Director General ISSI, Ambassador Suhail Mahmood for his welcome remarks. Ambassador Suhail Mahmood is serving as the Director General of the Institute of Strategic Studies Islamabad. Ambassador has been a career foreign service officer with diplomatic experience spanning 37 years that included various assignments at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as Pakistan's mission abroad in both bilateral and multilateral arenas. He joined the Foreign Service of Pakistan in 1985. From April 2019 to September 2022, Ambassador Suhail Mahmood served as the 30th Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. Prior to his appointment as the Foreign Secretary, he served as Pakistan's High Commissioner to India. Earlier, he had served as Pakistan's Ambassador to Turkey, uh, Thailand, and Permanent Representative to the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific Bangkok. Ambassador Suhail Mahmood holds a master's degree in international affairs from the Columbia University, New York, as well as a master's in history from Qaeda Azam University, Islamabad. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished participants, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. I would like to begin by extending a very warm welcome to all the guests joining us at this seminar organized by the Institute of Strategic Studies in connection with 25th anniversary of yom e takbir on 28th of May, the day Pakistan crossed the nuclear Rubicon and restored strategic balance in the region. We are particularly grateful to our distinguished speakers who would be sharing their thoughts and perspectives from their respective vantage points. We are privileged to have a special video message from Lieutenant General Retired Khalid Kidwai, Advisor, National Command Authority and former Director General of SPD. <laughs> of those joining us in person, I extend a special welcome to Dr. Anwar Pervesav, former Chairman, Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, and Mr. Mohammad Kamra Nakhtar, Additional Secretary, Arms Control and Disarmament, as well as Policy Planning and Public Diplomacy, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In all, we have eminent former diplomats and servicemen, members of the diplomatic corps, academics, area study experts, practitioners, and university students. I'm confident that they will find the deliberations both illuminating and fruitful. Distinguished participants, 28th May 1998 was one of the most consequential days in the history of Pakistan. I would like to share how veteran diplomat and former foreign secretary and foreign minister Abdul Sattar has captured the essence of the occasion in one of his books. And I quote, at 3.16 p.m. on 28 May, young physicist Muhammad Arshad, who had made the largest contribution to the trigger design, was given the honor to press the button. Five bombs exploded simultaneously in the sealed tunnel. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif declared Pakistan had settled the score. The nation was jubilant. Seismic centers around the world confirmed the, S the emergence of seventh nuclear power, unquote. Reaching that point was by no means easy. Indeed, it was achieved despite very heavy odds. In fact, Pakistan was forced to make, take the nuclear path in the face of India's persistent hostility, continued diplomatic intransigence, 
and inexorable steps towards nuclearization of South Asia. The years between May 1974, when India conducted its first nuclear test explosion, and May 1998, when it conducted a series of five nuclear tests, Pakistan faced tremendous political and diplomatic pressure, multiple sanctions, denial of technology, export restrictions, and patently discriminatory international policies and practices. The primary purpose was to coerce Pakistan into forsaking any nuclear option, while India's nuclear weapons program continued to develop unrestrained. Added to this was India's own aggressive posture, especially after the May 1998 nuclear tests, when the ruling BJP leaders made highly provocative and belligerent statements. India's then Deputy Prime Minister and Home Minister L.K. Advani said, and I quote, Islamabad has to realize the change in the geostrategic situation in the region and the world, and India is resolved to deal firmly with Pakistan in Kashmir, unquote. The Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, Madan Lal Kurana, threatened that Pakistan will now be taught a lesson. Another minister, K.L. Sharma, added that India was now in a position to take control of Azad Kashmir. Some even mischievously mocked Pakistan and asserted that India's nuclear tests had called Pakistan's nuclear bluff and that Pakistan possessed no such capability. Responding effectively to the existential threat posed by India's declared nuclearization and in the face of New Delhi's continued irresponsible rhetoric, demonstrating Pakistan's nuclear deterrent capability was an imperative. It was also imperative for dissuading India from making any miscalculation or undertaking any misadventure. Our nation, which had rendered enormous sacrifices and relentlessly supported the nuclear program over decades, was awaiting a fitting response. Surely, this was the time to show national resolve. It is most gratifying that our leaders, scientists, engineers, technicians, security personnel, strategists, and diplomats were equal to the task. Through its six tests conducted on 28th and 30th of May, Pakistan indeed settled the score. Distinguished participants, the 25 years since the 1998 tests are a good juncture to reflect on how we have fared thus far and how we go forward. First and foremost, Pakistan has made maintained a robust operationalized deterrent capability despite India's growing capacities and increased external support for its capabilities, including in cyber and outer space. Pakistan has been fully cognizant of India's shifting nuclear doctrine and force posture. Pakistan's nuclear deterrence remains firmly in place against the full spectrum of threats at the strategic, operational, and tactical level. Second, Pakistan has put in place an impeccable nuclear safety and security regime. For this purpose, elaborate legislative and regulatory frameworks, necessary institutional mechanisms, and requisite systems and measures have been instituted. Just recently, <clears throat> DGIAEA Rafael Grossi lauded Pakistan's nuclear security as world class and described Pakistan as a privileged partner of IAEA. Third, Pakistan's credentials as a responsible nuclear state have been reinforced internationally. Pakistan's adherence to international conventions, norms, and best practices remains exemplary. Pakistan is fulfilling its obligations under UN Security Council 15, Resolution 1540, and Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism. And it is also adhering to NSG guidelines. Pakistan is also constructively engaged with international export control regimes as appropriate. Fourth, Pakistan has upscaled the peaceful uses of technology in support of its socioeconomic development endeavors, including the attainment of SDGs. Pakistan's Energy Security Plan 2030 envisaged 5% of 8,800 megawatts of electricity through nuclear power generation. Now, with the commissioning of new power plants and others envisaged, the plan foresees an ambitious 42,000 megawatts by 2050. 
the use of nuclear technology in medicine, agricultural research, the environment, and other vital fields continue to grow. Fifth, Pakistan has maintained its active nuclear diplomacy. On the one hand, it has been engaged in countering the propaganda and smear against Pakistan's nuclear program, projecting the true rationale of acquiring nuclear weapons capability for deterring aggression and fighting discrimination and double standards in the treatment of Pakistan on nuclear non-proliferation issues. On the other hand, nuclear diplomacy continues to project Pakistan's policies of restraint and responsibility and pursue efforts for Pakistan's nuclear mainstreaming. Uh, distinguished participants, Yom Takbir is an occasion both for national pride and thanksgiving. Pakistan's nuclear program, supported by complete national consensus, remains the bedrock of our impregnable national security and an invaluable source for accelerated socioeconomic progress. It plays a pivotal part in advancing Pakistan's core objectives of peace and development. There should be no doubt that our next generations would shoulder the immense responsibility of carrying this program forward with the same commitment and resolve as did their predecessors. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now play a special message by Lieutenant General Retired Khalid Ahmed Gidbai. General Gidbai has led highly meritorious military service for 49 years. He was awarded the Sword of Honor at the Pakistan Military Academy. He saw frontline combat action in erstwhile East Pakistan in 1971. He has held a variety of prestigious command staff and instructional appointments. After the May 1998 nuclear test, he pioneered the establishment of Pakistan's National Command Authority, NCA. He served as DGSPD for 15 years and since 2014 is an advisor to the NCA. As DGSPD, he conceived, articulated, and executed Pakistan's nuclear policy and deterrence doctrine comprehensively. He translated these doctrines into a robust nuclear force structure, oversaw and ensured the establishment of Army, Navy, and Air Force strategic force commands, including the development and operationalizations of variety of nuclear weapons. He is also the architecture or architect of Pakistan's civilian and nuclear energy vision, which will provide Pakistan 42,000 megawatts of electricity as well as the National Space Program 2040. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Chairman, Board of Governors, the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, ISSI, Ambassador Sohail Mahmood, Director General, Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, Mr. Malik Qasim Mustafa, Director Arms Control and Disarmament Center, ACDC at the IWSI. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. I am greatly honored to have been asked by the Arms Control and Disarmament Center of the ISSI to send a message on the occasion of this important seminar to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Yom Takbir. Having had the privilege of deep association with Pakistan nuclear program, from the post Yom Takbir period onwards, stretching now to 25 years in itself, I shall be very happy indeed to share my thoughts on the topic that has been very well chosen to comprehensively cover all aspects of Pakistan nuclear program and the effects that it generates in promoting peace and stability in South Asia and development inside Pakistan. In Pakistan's national calendar of important events that we celebrate, 28th May and 30th May 1998 are two dates in Pakistan history that have come to occupy a special place of pride as well as dates that represent national strength, national resolve and national will to protect Pakistan. These sentiments run across the social fabric and political spectrum of Pakistan irrespective. The people in the streets of Pakistan own and support the nuclear program. The slightest hint of danger to Pakistan nuclear capability arouses suspicions and the people of Pakistan make it a point to make it clear that no compromises on this account will ever be acceptable. Pakistan's historic decision to respond 
to India's five nuclear tests of 11th and 13th May 1998, with six nuclear tests of our own, was the culmination of a comprehensive national political, scientific, strategic and diplomatic effort going back to 1972 to preserve Pakistan's national security at all costs against external aggression. As is well known, the two events that became catalysts in forcing Pakistan's hand to choose a path of developing nuclear weapons in search of everlasting security were the humiliation of the 1971 war followed by India's testing of a nuclear device at Pokhara in May 1974. The serious strategic consequences of both these events exposed the vulnerability of Pakistan's security against an adversary that not only traditionally enjoyed the advantages of relative asymmetry in conventional forces, but had also demonstrated its military capability in no uncertain terms. Its political will and intention to employ that capability in the ruthless pursuit of its political objectives was made quite clear to Pakistan on both occasions. All credit and everlasting national gratitude, therefore, to Pakistan's national leadership of the time for responding by doing the right thing by Pakistan and taking the right decision at the right time in the interest of Pakistan's security by proceeding on the nuclear weapons route and, mind you, against the greatest of odds. Any decision other than this would have been a strategic disaster and serious dereliction of responsibility. Today, as we celebrate 25 years of Yom Takbir, we must begin by first of all paying tribute to the founding fathers of Pakistan's nuclear program in the political, scientific, strategic and diplomatic fields and salute those whose collective determination, political wisdom and vision and scientific expertise allows Pakistanis today to live and breathe in an environment of relative peace and stability without fear of external aggression or a repeat of 1971. Pakistan nuclear project can be neatly divided into two clear eras. One, the period from 1972 to May 1998, spanning 26 years, which saw the right political decision being taken across a unified political spectrum, irrespective of the personalities or governments in power breathtaking scientific milestones and breakthroughs being achieved and superlative diplomacy at its best in providing a diplomatic cover and shielding the national nuclear effort from external harm. Allah was clearly on our side when he provided breathing space to Pakistan nuclear program for nearly a decade when the USSR invaded Afghanistan in 1979 and the international focus on Pakistan nuclear project was pushed into the background. This first era of 26 years enabled Pakistan to excel and move rapidly up a number of scientific notches from level zero to a point when in two weeks time after the Indian test, Pakistan's scientific community demonstrated its sound professional capabilities by celebrating success on 28th and 30th May 1998 in style. The world and India were stunned. Pakistan had balanced out the strategic equation for all times to come and from a strategic viewpoint, India's advantage of relative conventional asymmetry and its strategies to employ the military instrument in support of its political objectives stood compromised. India has not been able to recover ever since from the restoration of strategic balance in South Asia. While there is a vast number of silent soldiers and heroes of Pakistan's strategic scientific community, who contributed in fortifying Pakistan national security. Some names from amongst the leaders must be taken to acknowledge their devotion and single-minded effort in leading their super teams to success. Professor Abdul Salam, Dr. I.A. Usmani, Mr. Munir Ahmad Khan, Dr. Ashwaq Ahmad, Professor Dr. Riyazuddin, Dr. Samar Mubarak Mand, Mr. Parvez Bhatt, Mr. Anwar Ali, Mr. Irfan Burney, Dr. Ansar Parvez, Mr. Naeem Ahmad, Dr. Ghulam Nabi from the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, the PAEC, the one and only Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan from the Dr. A.Q. Khan Research Laboratories, the KRL, along with his superb team, which comprised of Dr. Fakhar Hashmi, Dr. Javed Mirza, 
ڈاکٹر نسیم احمد مسٹر کریم احمد ڈاکٹر اعجاز مختار ڈاکٹر ولایت حسین اینڈ اے ہوسٹ آف ادرز دیز لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹمین آر سم آف پاکستان جینوئن ہیروز ٹو ہوم وی او آر ڈیپسٹ گریٹیٹیوڈ اینڈ رسپیکٹس فار میکنگ پاکستان سیکیور فرام ایکسٹرنل ایگریشن دا سیکنڈ نیوکلیئر ایرا آف پاکستان نیوکلیئر پروجیکٹ کمنس فرام دا پوسٹ مے نائنٹین نائنٹی ایٹ and can be counted till as of today, spanning the next 25 years. The threads of the nuclear project were picked up from the end of the first era, when the scientists proved Pakistan's nuclear capability through nuclear tests. <coughs> the work in this second era was carried out forward through the stages of conceiving, developing and securing Pakistan's nuclear capability by converting it into a robust, comprehensive, operationalized capability based on a variety of nuclear weapons. As a consequence, Pakistan's nuclear deterrence capabilities today are based on a well-balanced triad of strategic forces based on land, air, and sea-based capabilities which deter aggression comprehensively. These operate under the umbrella of a strong command and control system under the National Command Authority, the NCA, and the Strategic Plans Division, the SPD, and are articulated through the policy of full spectrum deterrence. <clears throat> Taking advantage of this occasion for better understanding, I'll briefly dwell upon the articulation and implications of Pakistan's policy of full spectrum deterrence and how it keeps India's aggressive designs, including the Indian military's cold start doctrine in check, thereby contributing directly to the enforcement of peace, howsoever fragile it might seem, and retention of strategic stability in South Asia. Pakistan's full spectrum deterrence capability, while remaining within the larger philosophy of credible minimum deterrence, comprises horizontally of a robust trial services inventory of a variety of nuclear weapons, a triad if you may. It is held on land with the Army Strategic Force Command, the ASFC, at sea with the Naval Strategic Force Command, the NSFC, and in the air with the Air Force Strategic Command, the AFSC. Vertically, the spectrum encapsulates adequate range coverage from 0 meters to 2,750 kilometers, as well as nuclear weapons destructive yields at three tiers, strategic, operational, and tactical. India's vast eastern and southern geographical dimensions are therefore entirely covered. Specifically, the articulation of full spectrum deterrence implies the following. That Pakistan possesses the full spectrum of nuclear weapons in three categories, strategic, operational, and tactical, with full range coverage of the large Indian landmass and its outlying territories, there is no place for India's strategic weapons to hide. That Pakistan possesses an entire range of weapons yield coverage in terms of kilotons or KTs, and the numbers strongly secured to deter the adversary's declared policy of massive retaliation. Pakistan's counter-massive retaliation can therefore be as severe, if not more. That Pakistan retains the liberty of choosing from a full spectrum of targets in a target-rich India, notwithstanding the indigenous Indian Ballistic Missile Defense BMD or the Russian S-400, to include counter-value, counter-force, and battlefield targets. With the foregoing explanation, it will be quite clear that the second era comprising of the last 25 years of Pakistan nuclear capability should be seen as the seamless continuation of Pakistan's strategic journey that began with the first era of 26 years. Chronologically speaking, therefore, the two neat time compartments, while being complementary to each other, would be first era from 1972 to May 1998, and the second era from May 1998 to May 2023 as of today. The journey carries on, nevertheless, in pursuit of scientific and strategic excellence, seeking qualitative improvements, but clearly shying away from a mindless and quite unnecessary nuclear arms race. In the future, too, Pakistan's full spectrum deterrence capability will continue to ensure that peace and strategic stability in South Asia will prevail, and that instability will not be allowed to be introduced. If I may say, the illogical logic of mutually assured destruction, MAD, MED, will remain as relevant in South Asia 
as it does in Europe and across the Atlantic. Before I conclude, I should briefly touch upon the aspects of the use of Pakistan nuclear capabilities in pursuit of civil applications for development. I am sure that Dr. Ansar Parvez will have much more to say in his presentation later today. Pakistan's crowning success in this regard has been in the field of nuclear energy, wherein in pursuit of the NCA approved Nuclear Energy Vision 2050, Pakistani scientists and engineers have delivered seven nuclear power plants, which include CANAP-1 of 120 megawatts, Chashma-1, Chashma-2, Chashma-3 and Chashma-4 of 325 megawatts each and CANAP-2 and CANAP-3 of 1100 megawatts each. If only governments would be more supportive, the Nuclear Energy Vision 2050 plans to deliver 42,000 megawatts of electricity by 2050. And for an academic comparison, this is roughly the equivalent of 10 Kalabang dams. Additionally, the nuclear sector has also contributed immensely in running 19 cancer treatment hospitals across all provinces of Pakistan and nuclear agriculture research centers. PAEC also runs a first rate degree awarding university, the Pakistan Institute of Engineering and Applied Sciences, PIAS, in order for Pakistani students to undertake undergrad, masters and PhD programs in sensitive disciplines which otherwise would be denied to them internationally. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan nuclear project has delivered in all areas of national endeavor, especially so in making Pakistan secure from external aggression. The deterrence effects generated by Pakistan's strategic program have provided Pakistan with a strategic shield for times to come and has rendered India's advantages of relative conventional asymmetry near irrelevant. And for this, no amount of homage that we can pay to all our national heroes who made this possible would be enough. Yawm-e Takbir must continue to be celebrated with humility and gratitude to Allah for making Pakistan safe and secure. I wish the arms control and disarmament center of the IWSI and all the participants of a very successful seminar. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, our first panelist for today's event, Major General Retired Usaf Ali couldn't join us due to a a, due to a pressing official commitment. Our next panelist for today's event, Dr. Ansar Parvez. Uh, Dr. Ansar Parvez is a former uh, chairman of Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, PAEC. In his various capacities in PAEC, he has contributed to the development of human resource and application of nuclear technology in the areas of medicine and agriculture. He has played a pivotal role in the development of nuclear power in the country. He was also elected as the chairman of the IAEA Board of Governors. Currently, he is serving as advisor nuclear power to the National Command Authority and chairman Board of Governors National Center for Physics. He has been awarded Elali Imtiaz for his services to the country. I would now request Dr. Ansar Parvez to take floor for his remarks on peaceful applications of nuclear technology in Pakistan. You have the floor, sir. I'm honored to be talking to this uh, August gathering, and I'm uh, grateful to those uh, who invited me to come here and say a few words about the peaceful applications of nuclear technology. And I think the kind of audience that we have, uh, some of the things, or as a matter of a lot of things that I'll say here would probably be already known to them, but I'll just try to cover those things from a different angle and provide a little bit of the basics, the, the underlying principles that has made all of these things possible. So as a matter of fact, when we talk about nuclear technology, it is basically nuclear radiations which come out of the nucleus or nuclear fission. When a nucleus breaks up into two parts and produces energy or nuclear fusion, when two nuclei combine uh, to somehow uh, produce energy. And as we all know very well, that nuclear fusion only uh, takes place at the sun uh, right now. And in the, on, on Earth, some laboratories have been able to produce nuclear fusion, but only for a limited time, as a matter of fact, less than 100 seconds. And a lot of effort is made, being made for the last many, many years. Nuclear fusion, of course, is one that we all know very much. And that is uh, the, the one that is responsible for making devices and also for nuclear power plants, depending upon how you utilize this thing. So nuclear radiations, um, I'm sure a lot of you know that 
uh, from nuclei, three types of radiations can come out. One is what we call alpha particle. They are heavy particles, charged particles. They do not go very far, but they can have a big impact if they hit you. Gamma rays are electromagnetic radiations like this, ray, like this light or like the X-rays, but they have far more penetration than the X-rays, and therefore they provide us a capability to see inside the thing that gamma rays and ordinary light, of course, cannot provide. And beta particles are charged particles, but they are light particles, which means they can penetrate and then they can import their energy. And we think you use these three radiations either to see through things or to impart energy to an area where we want to impart. And we want to impart energy maybe to kill some tumors or maybe to kill some bacteria. But of course, just as these radiations can kill uh, these tumors and have an effect on the, on the tumor, they can also have an effect on the healthy cell. And this is another point that will cover up the, how this effect uh, can or cannot affect our life. So because of the characteristics that I told you about, uh, health sector, agriculture sector, food preservation, underground water studies, industry security, all of these are actually a derivative of the qualities of nuclear radiations that I just talked about. Health sector, we mentioned agriculture, there are crops. If you can uh, irradiate the crops, you can mutate them. Then maybe you can produce crops which give better yield, production, which gives, uh, which are resistant to drought, which are resistant to, to insects, and which maybe produces larger grain. So all these things can contribute uh, if, you, if you can probably uh, develop the, this uh, crop variety. And food preservation, of course, you kill the bacteria. This means the food can last longer, uh, the, the fruit and vegetable and whatever. And underground water studies, because we can see uh, through things, so we can see the water flow inside by injecting radioactive fluid into this water. And of course, in industry and, uh, and security, of course, because we can, the, the capability of seeing through things also helps us to uh, in our security matter. So basically uh, in health, diagnostics and treatment, as we already talked about, agriculture, crop mutation and food uh, preservation, industry, non-destructive testing, non-destructive testing, leakage detection and quality control and on underground water studies, of course. And there's a famous uh, story, I think people sitting here know that uh, in Shalamar Bagh, once they had a leakage and they did not know where the leakage was coming from, because all the piping was underground and one way was to just uh, dig everything out. Or you inject some radioactive fluid in it and then depending upon the flow of that radioactive fluid, which you can detect from outside the surface, you can tell where the leakage is taking place. So this capability uh, allows you to see inside, uh, th to see water inside. And also you can maybe uh, inject some radioactivity in some place and then you go to different places to see if it is arriving there. So that way, also, you can tell how the water is movement is taking place. And as already talked by, uh, mentioned by General Kitwa here, Pakistan Ramadi Commission has 19 medical centers, which are basically used for diagnostics and for uh, treatment. Uh, the good thing about these centers is that uh, they accept the, the, no matter what the stage of the cancer is, they accept it. And more than a million patients everywhere come to these uh, centers. And the charges are also very low. And for those, who have been to these centers, uh, they probably know that although they are run in public sector by the government, but still the quality of service they provide is far superior because they are run by Atomic Energy Commission. And similarly, there are four agriculture centers which do the kinds of things that we already uh, talked about. And this is uh, about food preservation. There are two units uh, in, in, in Multan Road uh, near Lahore where radiation is, uh, where food uh, and items are exposed to uh, radiation. And probably you know very well that these radiations not only ensure that these food products will remain last, uh, long, last longer, mm -hmm. but there is also sometimes an export requirement for the countries which import these fuels, they want to make sure that these have been exposed to these radiation so that our kind of bacteria does not go uh, into their countries. And similarly, non-destructive testing, you can use it for, for this purpose as well uh, because of the capability has, and this is what I was talking about security. These are the things placed inside a truck and from outside you can tell how, what kind of things are placed and how they are arranged. So these are the capabilities of sync. And since we are talking about radiation, and since I know I was, as a matter of fact, when K2, K3 was uh, being built, there was a lot of, uh, uh, civil societies which went to the court, took a stay order, and there were also some public opinion whether these radiations, how harmful these radiations can be. And we know that there is a general fear because 
the problem with nuclear radiation is that they, they are invisible. You cannot see them. And, and also their effects can be long uh, term. If, if you get burned, if you get hit, you know immediately. But if you are exposed to radiation, what effect it is going to have, it could be a long time after that. And this is what the public perception is. So I think I thought that it was important, to, at least uh, for this audience, that I give some data and some number. Right now that we are sitting here, we are already exposed to a background radiation, which in Pakistan is approximately 3 millisieverts per year. This is the radiation that we are exposed to because of the cosmic radiation which is coming from the top, because of the radiation coming from here, because of the radiation which is coming from inside the body. Some of the things, the uh, elements that we are made of also emit radiation. Taken together, all of them give us a dose of 3 point, uh, oh, three, uh, approximately 3 MeV, uh, millisieverts per year. From X-rays, one X-ray gives you 2 millisieverts. I'm just trying to put things in perspective. A CT scan gives you 20 millisieverts. And if I'm going to build a nuclear power plant, or I'm going to build an X-ray facility, or I'm going to set up a nuclear medical center where radiations will be used, for general public, the dose limit that is set, which the regulator also ensures that it is never exceeded, is one millisievert per year. So you cannot add more than one millisievert to three millisieverts, which I get as a background. And, but three millisievert is the background radiation here, but there are countries in the world, there are places in the world with the background, sorry. Background radiation is like 400 millisieverts in Iran someplace, Brazil, 35 millisieverts, Kerala, India, 35 millisieverts. So these radiations can be much higher than background radiation and still people live there and also have, some, and this is a, an interesting slide that I, I built and I will always like to show it that if I fly from here to Karachi and come back, I'll spend 190 minutes um, closer to, to the cosmic radiation. And during this time from going from here to Karachi and coming back, I will get a total radiation dose of 0 0.01 millisievert as you can see here. And this is the same amount of dose that I will get if I live outside a nuclear power plant for one year. So if I travel from here to Karachi back, like living outside a nuclear power plant for one year. If I travel from here to Washington DC or California and come back, then it's almost 20 years lifetime. 20 years it's living around a plant boundary and the dose is the same. And therefore the pilots, they keep getting these doses. And in Europe, they also have this regulation that pilots can fly only these many hours. If they get fly more than that, they probably could get more dose, and there is a dose limit that you can get. We have already shown what those numbers are. Of course, the number that I show here, one millisievert per year, is for general public. But for those people who are working inside the plant, who are professionals, who know how to deal with the dose, this limit is higher. And now it said three millisieverts is the background that we have. 0.1 millisievert outside the nuclear power plant. One millisievert is what I can give to anyone. Below 200 millisievert, there is no apparent effect. And of course, uh, then as the dose increases, there cancer risk and high cancer risk. And of course, if the dose is above 2000 millisieverts, then fatality will begin to appear as would happen in the case of a nuclear explosion, for example. But th this slide only shows how people uh, are, you know, because every time you go in a nuclear power plant, you dress up, you make, want to make sure that you're not exposed to radiation. So a general public think that as if radiation is something which makes you look horrible and uh, or, or miserable. Now we come to the next, uh, this is nuclear fission that we already talked about. And it, what happens in nuclear fission, slide taken from someplace, a, a neutron gets into uranium-235, uranium-235 fissions, it produces energy and it also produces neutrons. If I can use one of these two neutrons that are produced here, shown in this slide, to cause another fission, then I have a critical system, which means if I have enough uranium-235 with me, and somehow I can make sure that one neutron causes more fission, then I have a system which will self-sustain itself. And if I can have a system where more than one neutron or both of these neutrons can cause fission, then I have a system which will multiply itself in a very short time because the time that is uh, consumed between two fissions is extremely small of the order of 10 minus 
9 or 10 minus 11 seconds. So, and that is how uh, when you are want to make a device, you want to make sure that the system is super critical and you are consuming using more than one neutron. And if you uh, using just one neutron per fission, then you have a nuclear power plant. And a nuclear power plant is not very different from a conventional power plant. Here is a the picture of a power plant where heat is being produced here by say a burning oil, gas and coal or whatever. And then it goes to a turbine. The turbine moves because of the pressure of the steam, the generator acts and then the, from the condenser, the steam is cooled and brought back to the uh, uh, main heating system. And in a nuclear power plant, the only difference is that instead of producing heat, from this coal, oil, and gas, the heat is produced by nuclear process inside a reactor vessel. And now we can come to some data and some numbers. Uh, the first nuclear power plant that Pakistan built, uh, as, as was also mentioned uh, here, was Karachi nuclear power plant, which became critical in 1972, but sir? 71. 1972, and 72, connect and you know the cost of that nuclear power plant at the time? $60 million only. And the Canadians gave this plant to Pakistan and Pakistan was the 15th country in the world to have a nuclear power plant operating. And if you look at the uh, these bars on our left-hand side, they include all the developed countries, except for our neighbor, Switzerland, Spain, Germany, Sweden, Japan, Italy, Belgium, France, USSR, USA, and uh, UK. And then Pakistan. Uh, came and become a country which was operating a nuclear power plant. And then there were many countries who joined later. And as you can see, after that, uh, this is this is what the trend is. And one of the things which all of us know is that Canop ki jo lifetime support was not provided by the vendor. And the this actually was also what they normally call a blessing in disguise because then we developed our own fuel, our own spare parts. But sab yahan pe bethe mein jane spare parts ka sara system set up kiya. So jo indianization hai, that came as a result of the fact that we were not provided the support by the vendor. But the consequence that Pakistan had to bear in that was also that the capacity factor of Canop was not very high because sometimes we didn't have the fuel, sometimes we did not have the spare parts, but still we kept that plant operating. The design lab was 30 years, but the plant was shut down after it's completed 50 years of safe operation. And then China uh, was uh, available, made the nuclear power plant available, and I call these four uh, power plants, which are around 325 megawatt, this harbinger of Park China collaboration in nuclear power. These plants are now operating near Cheshma. Mm -hmm. And after that, two more plants, 1100 megawatt, were built uh, in Karachi. And these are generation three power plants. The most modern, advanced nuclear power plants that are built anywhere in the world today. These two power plants. And the, these two power plants are 1100 megawatt. They have double containment. Whereas Chashma nuclear power plant has one containment, these have double containment, not only to contain the reactivity in case of an accident, but the outer uh, containment is designed to take the impact or commercial airline coming and making a direct hit to the, uh, to the containment. So many other features which are built into this passive safety system and whatever, but they are supposed to be far more safer than the uh, generation two plus uh, nuclear power plants, which are Chashmas. This graph here only shows how these power plants are operating. If a nuclear power plant, if any power plant can operate around 80% of power, we call it a good operating facility. If it operates 90% is excellent, but not many power plants can operate at the fuel. 80% is, is wonderful. And you see all our nuclear power plants, except for C1, as you can see this blue line, are operating at more than 85% capacity factor. Only C1 is 77%. And why C1 is, no, uh, is low? Because this was the first power plant that we took for China. This was the first power plant that China gave to a country. So initially they were teething problems. The, 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 the loss of power that we suffered in the early years, in spite of our good performance in the later years, still keeping the capacity factor, lifetime capacity factor low. But if you look at the line below it, which is current capacity factor, you see the beauty, 91% C1 and 101% uh, is uh, C2, C, C, C3. I'm sorry, uh, these are actually wrongly put. C1 should be here on the left and then uh, it's sliding uh, like Sorry about that. So the first one is C1, then C2, then C3, then C4, then K2, then K3. 
if you compare the capacity factor of these uh, power plants, nuclear power plants, with other power producing systems in the country, hydro or public service thermal, public sector thermal power plants or IPP, you can see how uh, better the performance is of the nuclear power plant. And there was one day this year in Pakistan when nuclear power, which is only 8% of the total installed capacity of the country, produced more than 25% of the requirement of the country. So these power plants are performing uh, very well. And if you look at the average generation cost, you can see how small the cost of nuclear power is compared to other uh, things which we have put here, wind, solar, oil, gas, RL, LNG, and hydro, et cetera. So nuclear in itself has low cost as we are operating them good performance and they are also provide base load electricity and this is very important ke jo some there should be some plants in the country which will provide you a base load of electricity otherwise uh, you cannot uh, keep a pace with especially with the india circle and this is the vision that general kudwai was talking about and this is what the planning was although we are uh, already uh, lacking behind it uh, in it but hopefully uh, things will get better and ultimately we should be able to get to something around uh, 40,000 megawatts by 2050, which right now might seem a lot. Because total Pakistan ki jo capacity, installed capacity is around 40,000, and we are talking about 40,000. But you know, this exponential growth in a doubling period, if you have like 5% GDP growth, and I hope Pakistan does get that, to get a 5% GDP, GDP growth in any country, the electricity growth must be 7%. And if the electricity growth is 7%, then this means the electricity must double in 10 years. And this means in the next 10 years, this 40 will become one, one eight, well, this 40 will become 80. In another 10 years, which is around 2040, this will be 160,000 megawatts. So what if if you have to, if you can get that kind of a GDP. Pakistan, right now the population growth in the last census is 3%. So of course you are going to lead up. And this is actually uh, the last slide, Abhi. I said the Bossari slide already, but I think we can skip that. So I always uh, show this slide, especially if I'm giving this presentation to the school, to the to, to the college students or uh, younger people. Okay, there's they will always talk about sustainable development goals. United Nations has 17 goals, and or un goals may 169 targets, hai, as you can see there. And there are 233 indicators that determine as to how well a country is following these goals. It's not Pakistan may be calm or but if you go and Google it, you will see how the developed countries, all most number of countries are working on this sustainable development. How they have set up KPIs to determine how they are going to reach there. And there are certain goals which must be reached by 2030. So what we try to, the point that we try to make here is that whatever we're doing in nuclear technology, whatever the Atomic Energy Commission is doing in not only using nuclear radiations, but also nuclear fission to produce power and whatever Atomic Energy Commission is doing to make this possible to set up schools, to set up, set up, uh, to set up universities so that the required training can be achieved to set up training centers so that we can train and educate people to perform the job because of all these things and because we are an employer and because we also provide job, how is this uh, atomic energy commission or how is this nuclear technology, how does it affect sustainable development? So I say that if I whether it will be a white arrow, which means we are doing a good contribution or a black arrow, which means we are doing something or X, which means we probably are not contributing at all. So first we ask them to make a guess, then we click it, but time so I'll just click them by myself. No poverty, we give a white, zero hunger because we are working on crops and everything, good health and well-being because we are nuclear medical center, quality education is black because we are doing some education, but we're not really controlling the educational system. Gender equality, yes and no, because you see sorry, the all people sitting here are male. We are American Commission ke senior yaha pe baithe. Clean water sanitation, we are not contributing anything. Clean affordable energy, yes, a big plus because nuclear does not uh, contribute to this uh, climate change effects. And it also does not emit any other uh, pollution. Decent work, black, yes and no. Industry innovation, 
because we talked about uh, looking into things. We talked about this agriculture products exporting and also uh, medical instruments. So we are uh, sort of uh, contributing to that. Reducing inequality, not much a difference. Sustainable cities, nothing much. Consumption and production, nothing much. Climate action, yes, we are making a contribution, but because only a small fraction of the total. So therefore, uh, we are we chose a black arrow, nothing much underwater, nothing much on land. Peace, justice, a little bit. If you run a good, efficient organization, take care of marriage, you, you give people what they should get, then you are contributing the peace. And of course, if you look at peace at a global and national level, then the nuclear deterrence capability is also contributing there. And then partnership for the goal, yes, of course, because Atomic Commission does interact with the IAEA, with International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy, with the CERN in Geneva, with WHO, whatever, what, whichever organized UNESCO, whichever organization wants to get in touch with our contact, we are open and we uh, expose ourselves. So thank you very much. I think I have some more. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansar Parvez. Ladies and gentlemen, our next panelist for today's event is Mr. Mohammed Kameran Akhtar. Mr. Kamran Akhtar is serving as an additional secretary for Arms Control and Disarmament Division and Public Policy and Planning Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Islamabad. Mr. Akhtar is a career foreign service officer with diplomatic experience spanning 27 years. He joined the Foreign Service of Pakistan in 1995. From 2010 to 2015, he served as a Director General Science and Technology at the OIC headquarters in Jatta. At the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he served as the Director General of Arms Control and Disarmament Division from 2015 to 2022. He served as Pakistan's alternative permanent representative in the National Atomic Energy Agency, Viana, and United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space from 2000 to 2005. He was also part of various important international treaty negotiations and bilateral political engagements like Pakistan-India nuclear CBMs, Pakistan-India conventional CBM, strategic and arms control talks with US, UK, Japan, Russia, France, China, and EU. He has also represented Pakistan at nuclear security summit process and various UN and IAEA export uh, experts uh, programs related to nuclear terrorism, nuclear safety and security, conventional arms control and arms trade treaty. I would now request Mr. Mohammed Kamran Akhtar to take the floor for his remarks on Pakistan's nuclear deterrence and diplomacy. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. Uh, as has been stated, uh, mm -hmm. I will be talking about Pakistan's deterrence and the role of diplomacy. Uh, however, I would like to begin my talk with a ra rather unusual uh, with a rather unusual note. Uh, I was wondering how many uh, of you are aware about what this image depicts? If, if you know about it, maybe. Uh, how many of uh, the people know about uh, what this image depicts? This image. Yeah, the, the, the image on the screen. Well, uh, the, well, this is uh, the image of a capture of a muon uh, at the Large Hadron Collider Experiment uh, CERN uh, in Geneva. And this capture of muon led to uh, the corroboration of the theory regarding the existence of the Higgs boson, the so-called God particle. And nearly half of the muon captures at the CERN uh, Large Hadron uh, Collider experiment in Geneva were made on detectors which were uh, made by Pakistan. Nearly half of those were. And these, this capture of muon and uh, the uh, discovery of Higgs boson is, uh, was a very important moment for big science at the international level. Before the discovery of Higgs boson uh, in 2012, there was difficulty in explaining the standard model of physics. Not only that, 
uh, this standard model of physics had a lot of contribution from a Pakistani scientist called Dr. Abdus Salam, the Nobel yeah. laureate, through his work on the electroweak theory. Pakistani scientists and engineers and technicians were also involved in the manufacturing of some of the physical components of the Large Hadron Collider. This and many other stories of the contribution of Pakistani scientists and engineers to uh, international science, to science and technology, mm -hmm. to socio-economic development in Pakistan, these stories are waiting to be told. And telling these stories is very important. Telling these stories is important because our adversaries would always like to associate Pakistan with retrogression, with extremism, with illiteracy, whereas there are very bright spots in Pakistan. Pakistan's nuclear program is one such story. And this story has a lot which is untold. There are a lot of contributions of the nuclear program to socio-economic development of Pakistan. When we talk about Pakistan's nuclear program, the image which comes forth is of missiles and nuclear weapons. However, we must not forget that Pakistan's nuclear program has its genesis in the Atoms for Peace program. The Atoms for Peace program, which also led to the establishment of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And the previous speakers have highlighted how Pakistan's nuclear, web, uh, uh, nuclear program has contributed to energy security, to the health sector, to agriculture, to water security, to energy security. Uh, Dr. Ansar Pervez gave a cross to uh, our contributions in terms of water security, but we know that the Pakistan Atomic en Energy Commission is doing work in isotope hydrology in terms of detecting uh, uh, sources of clean water. So this is right now the focus of Pakistan's nuclear diplomacy. We have this focus because of two reasons. Number one, Pakistan would like to qualify to a country which is known in terms of high technology exports. We have the expertise, we have the technology. We would like to commercialize our expertise and technology, and we would like to uh, export uh, this uh, services and technology in the area of peaceful applications of nuclear science. So that is why we are focusing on that. Number two, Pakistan is interested in the membership of the nuclear suppliers group and its mainstreaming in the nuclear order. And this establishes our credentials as a country with the potential to provide services and technology on the nuclear suppliers group. Having built this prelude, I come back to the role of diplomacy in terms of Pakistan's nuclear deterrence. To begin with, uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, nuclear program has been based on legality and on principled positions. Pakistan never signed the NPT, so we were never in violation of our, any of our uh, international uh, commitments or obligations when we developed our nuclear capability. So we have always been on the right side of legality. And that has enabled Pakistani diplomacy to stand up firm for Pakistan's national interest, to withstand pressure, pressure despite international censure. Uh, it was the foresight of Pakistani diplomats, including uh, Mr. Aga Shahi and many others who convinced the government of that time not to sign the NPT. Not to sign the NPT, not only because it was a discriminatory treaty, it accorded priority to the security of certain states while asked the other states to give up the nuclear options for their security. 
So it was a discriminatory treaty. It violated the principle of equal and undiminished security for all enshrined in the United Nations Charter. And it also discriminated in terms of creating a class of have and have nots. After that, Pakistan still maintained its principal support for nuclear disarmament and a world free of nuclear weapons. And this position was not inconsistent with Pakistan's status as a nuclear weapon state. It was not inconsistent because of the stipulations of the first special session of the United Nations General Assembly on Disarmament, the SSOD-1, which was adopted in 1978, the declaration of SSOD-1. That declaration very clearly identifies the link between nuclear disarmament and genuine security concerns of states. The genuine security concerns of the state, not only in terms of nuclear weapon adversaries, but only also in terms of unresolved disputes, in terms of conventional asymmetries, it recognizes all these linkages and conditionalities. And it proposes a nuclear disarmament process, which is non-discriminatory, it is proportionate and stepwise in that it should begin with the countries possessing the largest arsenals of nuclear weapon. It should be stepwise so that at no step of the disarmament process, any country or a group of countries is placed at a security disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other states. It recognized, it, it recognized that without addressing conventional asymmetries, nuclear disarmament cannot be achieved. So our commitment to nuclear disarmament will continue to be based on the principles enshrined in the SSOD-1. And with regard to SSOD-1, Pakistan's diplomacy contributed a lot. There is a long list of Pakistani nuclear diplomats like Mr. Iqbal Akhund and many others. I would uh, not go into an exhaustive list who were critical to uh, the incorporation of these uh, principles in the SSOD-1 during its negotiations in 1978. So Pakistani diplomacy has ensured that Pakistan's nuclear posture, Pakistan's nuclear weapon state status, its security concerns, and its commitment to international norms are not in contradiction with each other. There is a complete harmony. It is based on legality and principled positions. And this manifests in every aspect of our nuclear positions. Take, for example, the issue of FMCT, the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty. Pakistan has always supported a treaty uh, for prohibiting the production of fissile material for nuclear weapons, which is more comprehensive, which includes in its scope the existing stockpiles of fissile materials rather than freezing the existing asymmetries. Because if the existing asymmetries are frozen, then it puts certain countries at a permanent advantage and certain countries at a permanent security disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the other states. And this violates the SSOD-1 principle. Until the time that any proposal on FMCT is not consistent with uh, our position on SSOD-1, Pakistan is willing to stand up for its national security interest. The consistency of our position on avoidance of arms race, on restraint and responsibility, is also manifested in our proposal for the strategic restraint regime, which we propose to India in the context of South Asia. It includes three elements, which is nuclear and missile restraint. It includes uh, conven conventional balance. It includes resolution of the Kashmir dispute. And this again, these are the three elements which we have picked up from the SSOD one. And we will continue to follow this policy. Avoidance of an arms race is in Pakistan's interest. 
we are committed to international standards on export controls, nuclear safety and security. Being a middle power, it is in the interest of Pakistan to have a strong norms-based system, which is non-discriminatory, which is equal, which respects the principle of equal security for all. Because a strong rule-based system, which is non-discriminatory, is the best security guarantee for any power, middle power, against any arbitrary actions by more powerful states. So Pakistan will remain committed to the principles of the international non-proliferation and disarmament regime, provided that it is consistent with other principles of the UN Charter as well. On nuclear safety and security, uh, there was a time in the first decade of this century when a lot was said about Pakistan's nuclear security. A lot of concerns were expressed. But as a confident nuclear weapon state, we have come a long way. Now we have the Pakistan Center for Excellence on Nuclear Security. We have the Nuclear Institute of, on Safety and Security run by the PNRA, the Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority which are designated as IEEA collaboration centers and IEEA centers for nuclear safety and security. And we have people coming from all over the world to get training in nuclear safety and security at these centers. Uh, the previous DG IEEA, uh, Mr. Amano, and the current DG, Mr. Grossi, both during their visits to Pakistan, praised the highest standards on safety and security um, being maintained by Pakistan. So I, at times, do not support people getting apologetic about our nuclear safety and security record or trying to project too much what we have been doing in terms of nuclear safety and security because, uh, number one, it is in our own national security interest. We have to protect our assets. It is in our own national security interest. Uh, we confidently have been interacting with the nuclear threat initiative. We engaged them. We provided them information on the steps we have taken in terms of uh, beefing up our national uh, nuclear safety and security standards. And as a result, in the last report of the NTI, Pakistan was the most improved country in terms of nuclear security above India. So we are doing good in terms of nuclear diplomacy. We will be continuing to do that. Uh, final word. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier that we have applied for the nuclear suppliers group. We think we are a mainstream country in the nuclear order. We qualify for the nuclear suppliers group because we have the capability and knowledge and technology to provide the items on the control list of the NSG. We have the commitment to non-proliferation, nuclear safety and security. One thing perhaps which we need to do, and there are many people sitting over here from various, uh, various uh, departments and organizations of Pakistan, that we need to have a whole of the country whole of the government approach towards our nuclear diplomacy. For example, when India pitches for the membership of the NSG, it links its uh, bid for the NSG membership with it, for the fulfillment of its commitment vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change, the Paris Accord. I have hardly seen any holistic uh, narrative coming out of Pakistan uh, to this uh, effect because we are perhaps weak in terms of interagency coordination. So there is a policy deficit which our nuclear diplomacy has to deal with. Number two, as I mentioned, now that we are a nuclear weapon state, we have to manifest it through confidence. And confidence comes through speaking softly while carrying a big stick. We don't have to add adjectives to qualify our deterrence. We have a credible minimum deterrence and credible means a deterrence which can deal with any uh, threat along the spectrum of threats to safeguard our national security. So 
I think we 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 need to shed some of the adjectives to qualify our nuclear deterrence poster. We need to have a single spokesperson. We don't need people who are brandishing nuclear capability of Pakistan at the drop of the hat. We know we have that capability and we know how to use it. We don't need to brandish it at the drop of the hat. And uh, Mr. Anshar Purvez uh, did uh, show some of slides. This is one of the slides uh, which uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with the help of PAEC and with the help of SPD, we got a brochure published, which is available on the website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we have circulated it to various missions at the international level. This shows how Pakistan is applying nuclear science and technology in the achievement of 11 out of the 17 SDGs. Again. These are some of the applications of nuclear science and technology in terms of SDGs, uh, in terms of uh, treatment of sewage water, uh, um, uh, in terms of measuring uh, glacial melts. Uh, this is water sanitation. Uh, this is the desalination plant, uh, which was designed by HMC3. Uh, Dr. Ansar Pervez mentioned role of nuclear power in terms of providing clean energy and in terms of providing a stable base load. These are some of the physical pieces of Large Hadron Collider at the uh, CERN uh, in uh, Geneva, which Pakistan provided. This is the sextopole uh, magnet, which Pakistan provided for the Sesame project in Jordan. And finally, coming back to my first slide, uh, a very known US photographer, Mr. Ansel Adams, uh, very famously remarked that there is nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy object. But I believe there is something worse. That is a fuzzy image of a very sharp object. We have very bright spots in Pakistan. I think it is upon us, the diplomats now, to highlight those bright spots. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for question and answer session. I would request the participants to please first introduce yourself and keep your questions short. The session will be moderated by the Director General ISSI Ambassador Suhail Mahmood. Thank you, Ms. Hamna. Certainly, I'm sure everybody would agree that we have had a very uh, distinguished panel and we got some very comprehensive, insightful and rich contributions from all of them. So first thing on my behalf, a very a profound thanks to all the speakers and for their uh, contributions. As Ms. Hamna said, we would request to the uh, intending questioners or commentators to identify themselves, keep the comments or questions brief, and also indicate to whom the question is addressed. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's been a very interesting session. And I would not agree with everything that was said, but some very interesting things were said. And uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Shaukat Hamid Khan. I spent about 37 years in the Atomic Energy Commission and Planning Commission and GIK and also at Comstec. But I also spent two of those P atomic energy years at CERN, at CMS, the Compact Muon Solidite. They had a problem and they, chose, they accepted our proposal. So I would go there, come back, design, and finally they accepted our system and 40 laser systems are installed in CERN. And the purpose is to, sorry, let me just explain. Here is something, the accelerator are in like cylindrical box, one, cylinder over another and over another, it goes like this, 50 feet in di diameter, 150 feet long. And when the collision takes place and these things fly out, then you want to know the trajectory. You can only know the trajectories by looking at these detectors. And if they move to relative to each other, you have an error. They want it better than 1 50th of a millimeter. Our laser system, the system we designed, give they gave them two microns, one over 500th of a millimeter. And I have two or three people there uh, maintaining the system all the time. But let me move on from there. Uh, I, uh, Kamran Saab has mentioned this and safety and so on. 
but he forgot one other little aspect uh, co contribution from the Atomic Energy Commission, the Lin LINAC just for Sudan. And these are small peaceful contributions that uh, Sudan had a linear accelerator in the medical plants, which went bad. They would spend a lot of money. And Kamran Saab had a nuclear background. He didn't mention that, by the way, with the Atomic Energy Commission plus international agency, the Foreign Office. So Nori in Islamabad and Sudan, the, the hospital there, had a video link. And although they would discard the whole thing and buy a new one, two to three hours of discussions and operation, you know, fine tuning, got the thing going. One example. Uh, Ansar Saab, nuclear power, wonderful. But I have a question. What do you do with the nuclear waste? No country in the world is ready to manage nuclear waste, long-lived nuclear states. That is a huge problem. And uh, about safety, you've talked about it. Uh, uh, Kamran Saab has talked about it. Our safety record is certainly better than, let's say, our neighbor India. And India has had about 29 accidents and three or four pretty bad ones. And lastly, if Kidwai Saab is still here, I'd last like to ask, uh, mention this to him. He's taken some names, mentioned people who contributed. I think he missed out a few names. There were a few others we would have put into it. And um, uh, some people get missed out just because they retired and they were no longer there in 98. And that seems to need to be rectified sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a specially recorded message from Kidwai Saab, so, I, so he won't be able to respond no. to that. But you can also imagine that in a short message, you can only take that many names. I'm sure you will understand that. Uh, Dr. Saab, would Gee, you want please. to respond quickly? Gigi, Merahala, one of the things that you asked is about nuclear waste. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a very critical issue, and uh, only the other day I was uh, communicating with IAEA on another matter, and I wrote to them, and they did not like what I said there, and I said that the issue of nuclear waste has been created by the nuclear industry itself. They demonized a thing which actually wasn't that big. They thought initially, you know, when initially the nuclear power plants were built, they thought, what would they do with the waste? they will put it in a uh, rocket and send it to the space. There were such exotic solutions uh, which were being suggested. And then they came up with a strategy. They said that we should take this nuclear waste and we'll burn it in geological deposits so that it becomes a part of this environment there and it will never come, come back to our life. And that thing failed. US spent almost $20 billion, I think in Yukawa Mountain and ultimately nothing happened no such thing could be uh, done and this was not possible because nobody wanted, uh, nobody knew as to what would happen in 5,000 years. So my first answer to the question is that whenever you do something, you always, this is what is called tinkering with mother nature. As we live on this earth, as we live here, whatever we do, it is not possible that we are not going to disturb the ecosystem. There will be a kind of disturbance. The only thing that we need to make sure is, number one, the credit, the benefit that we take because of this dispenser outweighs the, the, the losses that it makes to the ecosystem. Now, as far as this nuclear waste is concerned, I just want to give you one example. Canop, which operated for 50 years, all the spent fuel, which is, see the nuclear waste is a very long term, but the is the high level nuclear waste or it is the spent fuel which is of concern. The low level waste, intermediate level, you can tackle them. There's not no not a big issue. The high level waste or these nuclear fuel, the the all the nuclear fuel that Canop used in 50 years of its life is stored or was stored in a swimming pool. The total volume or area of that swimming pool, I think, was less than in this room. No, much less than Okay, About point one. Yes, sir. And I also calculated, and there is an IA report on it, that all the nuclear fuel that was generated in nuclear, civil nuclear power plants, as the nice said, put together, will maybe occupy this space. And I used the data, and I made a lot of extravagant assumptions. And I calculated that all the nuclear waste or spent fuel that has been generated so far can be accommodated in an area of 700 meters by 700 meters and one meter high. This is it. One Islamabad sector is two 
kilometers, 2,000 meters. One subsector is one meter. So all I'm saying is that in this entire world, in this entire universe, Earth, you take out a space, which is maybe a kilometer by kilometer, and you stack it up there and you watch it. Why do you have to come up with exotic solutions of burying it where you cannot have it? So what is being done now after wasting 30, 40, 50 years because of the initial uh, euphoria or because of the initial optimism that nuclear industry has, now they are talking about long-term storages. So they are building long-term storages and they, are all, they also cost money, but you can leave it there. The good thing, the only good thing about nuclear waste is that with time the decay, the radioactive product decay and the, the lethality decreases. So you can wait for a few years, and this is what is being done now. You wait, you take this spent fuel out, you put it in the plant inside water for 10 years, 15 years, whatever. And if that tanks get started getting filled, you take it out, you build caskets, you put it in there, and then you can store it someplace. And you can just be four persons watching it. I'm not saying that this is like coming back and growing grass as it was before nuclear power started. But then this is a small price to pay for all the, the, the climate change saving that nuclear can do. And now, because nuclear industry was not able to sell itself, because nuclear industry could not tell people because nuclear industry could not take the fear of radiation out of the heart and mind of people, nuclear power in, in the United States, Europe, public would not allow any nuclear power plant to get built. No nuclear power plant is getting built in the United States now. The one under construction is now complete. There were 104 at one time, now there are 90 left. And after 20 years, all of them will be gone. And there is no replacement. In Europe, only I think UK is building one, and that's all. In France, which is actually okay. The only nuclear power plants are building China, India, Pakistan, Russia, and, and, and Bangladesh, and countries like this. But now, Europe is again turning it. Now they're realizing this mistake. So it's a, it's a long debate, sir. And problem is, I'm not saying that there's no problem, but I'm saying this is a problem that can be tackled. You can adopt the best solution, dump them off. <laughs> no, we all, no, no, they can, yeah, to bad, but you are in, in your country, any place, you have a lot of space available. What, what does it take to allocate a one kilometer or one kilometer space in the country at some place and then build a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer fence around it and then just watch it? That is not going anywhere. Uh, no, this is another issue. There was one thing, people said that tsunami you are building a nuclear power plant close to the ocean. What if a tsunami comes out? And the, this is like uh, three meter high scooper wave. I said, wait a minute. We have calculated the highest height that tsunami can get around Kano is like 1.5 meters. We know that from history. We have done the burst calculation and we are about 12 meter high. But tell me if an earthquake of the size that will bring a tsunami of two meters comes in Karachi, what will happen to the rest of the city? Where will the rest of the civilization go? Where, where, where would the rest of the electricity supply systems would go? Where, where the life would go? So what is the matter? You will not make this because tsunami. When the tsunami comes, you will also die. You will also die. You will also finish. It will be finished. So if it comes to such a big earth, that all the things will go from here and the Americans will come here, then probably there will come here, then probably there is no life remaining there in that area. Anyways, this will be the least of the concern in case of an earth. Now, security is safety. Do you want to say something? Yes. Just to add to that, um, after the Fukushima uh, incident, the IAEA upgraded some of its uh, standards for nuclear safety. And those recommendations which were formulated after those, they have been fully incorporated by Pakistan in its nuclear safety regime. So we are being very careful about that and the IAEA fully acknowledges that. Number two, now internationally, there is a move towards small and modular reactors. And Pakistan is also a member of the IEA working group on SMRs, the small and modular reactors. And they will have le much less concerns with regard to nuclear safety and security. So that is one area where we need to work because they will also enable local production of electricity rather than relying on a very large national grid, which is hard to manage. So these are the areas where we are working. 
we are also very seriously working on various aspects of the joint waste management convention which pakistan has not signed so far but we are a party to four of uh, the five iea conventions on nuclear safety and without uh, and and our implementation of these convention is peer reviewed is monitored by a group of iea member states every two years so we we are peer reviewed in terms of our nuclear safety standards but uh, i would end this intervention uh, with acknowledging that there are three people sitting here uh, dr ansar parvez mr parvez but and dr shaukat hamid i have had the pleasure of working with all three of them and dr shaukat hamid i i have been uh, uh, interacting very closely when he was the coordinator general of compstack and i was sitting in the oic and we were trying to promote science and technology in the muslim world so he's done some uh, remarkable work so of course the list uh, mentioned by general kedwai is not exhaustive <laughs> yes, sir may i just time see what kamran sahab ne bada logical or sophisticated jawab diya hai main iska ek bada ek emotional or practical jawab dena chahta hu safety ka see i told you can was built for 50 million that is point that is 0.5 million dollars per megawatt overnight cost of installed capacity chashma nuclear power plants were built for less than 2 million or around 2 million dollar per megawatt of installed capacity the canadian nuclear power plant the american nuclear power plant the european nuclear power plants which were built around the same time also were built in around 1000 to 2000 from 1 million dollar to 2 million dollars per megawatt all these power plants are operating safely all these power plants are doing well except maybe for three the first accident took place in tmi there was an accident we will still remember that and nothing happened nobody died there was no serious release of radioactivity from the plant just the, the plant went away it could not be but nothing happened chernobyl yes there was a major a major accident but that was because the operators turned off the controls and after tmi and chashma and chernobyl lot of emphasis was placed on training of people lot of it too much time on, on how to train people so that such accidents do not happen and then uh, of course fukushima there was a tsunami only two person died in that accident and those were swept away by the tsunami nuclear radiation se koi nahi mara of course 1000 persons died in japan because of this accident because they moved the people from one place to another and the older people they did not have their medicines or systems or hospital or whatever and they died and it turned out that in one particular case they moved the people from one place with higher lower radioactivity to place which has higher radioactivity because japanese were almost i think at that time confused and they always said that this was a made in accident made in japan canop which we have right now is around 4 million dollar per megawatt it is still producing the same electricity the nuclear power plants which is being built in uk is like 7 million dollars per megawatt and the one that united states has just completed is like 14 million dollars per megawatt so why because we are adding more safety more safety and more safety and that way we are actually turning taking the nuclear power plants out of business because agar i commercially if you are not commercially and economically viable how do you expect ke any country can can build a nuclear power plant तो ये जो एक्चुअली सेफ्टी की डिबेट है इसमें आई ऑलवेज ट्राई टू मेक दिस पॉइंट न्यूक्लियर इंडस्ट्री इट सेल्फ इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल दे आर ऑलवेज ऑन द डिफेंस दे डू नॉट कम आउट ऑन द ऑफेंस यू कैन स्मोक सिगरेट्स इट्स रिटर्न ऑन हेयर दैट सर्जन जनरल हैज डिटरमिन दैट स्मोकिंग हैजर्डस इज हेयर स्टिल आई स्मोक सिगरेट बिकॉज इट्स मेल मैच ऑफ है नो नो पीपल डू क्योंकि ये मैस्कुलिनिटी है मैं सिगरेट पी रहा हूँ और एक लड़की इसलिए सिगरेट पी रही है कि शी वॉन्ट्स टू स्मोक वो लिबरल है so this this is the attitude that you build around things and not defensive make it more expensive more expensive more expensive. people still don't have any faith jitna faith unko us waqt generation 2 mein bhi 2 million dollar utna hi faith aaj 8 million dollar per megawatt so there is something wrong that needs to be tackled thank you thank you so much i think we want to give opportunity to maximum people so i would request everybody to be brief yes dr adil sultan thank you very much sir uh... for giving me an opportunity and organizing this event um i am from airy university one of the deans but i have worked for only 14 years at the strategic plans division uh today is the silver jubilee of 1998 tests that's what we are celebrating and with humility as general kedwai also said 
but there is a apparent reluctance to talk about the military dimensions of nuclear weapons uh, uh, because we have nuclear capabilities since 50s we have been doing all these activities that dr answer also said and uh, we talk about but i think this occasion calls for how we appreciate or how we assess or analyze uh, what role nuclear capability has provided in our national defense i'm grateful to general kidwai and ambassador swell that they did mention about the military aspect also why i am i am referring specific to this is that uh, as kamran sahib is an old friend uh, and we have had very uh, interactive animated discussions on these and we agree to disagree very politely on these issues also he did say we should not be defensive or apologetic i think that's e that's equally good for the military capability also uh, but apparently we are defensive and we are reluctant to talk about the new uh, military dimension why it is important uh, for us we are uh, and some of the remarks that we should not be adding adjectives to our you know, nuclear posture of uh, policies i think those are essential throughout the cold war what we heard about mutual assured destruction all those things flexible response option thing that brings clarity in your decision making or employment policies and since nuclear capability is a national capability it is not owned by a particular institution i think nation needs to has the right to understand how this nuclear capability is being employed because they are going to be the effect of the entire country or the nation is and why this is important all countries even those who do not have nuclear weapons capability though they deliberate because they might be affected by these capability or the postures since we are more focused towards india or india very vibrant debate about whatever their nuclear posture or no first use policy and things like i think we also need to not discourage these debates and we not we need to encourage these debates because there are so many challenges that are evolving it's not only nuclear now the emerging technologies artificial intelligence cyber and the cross domain deterrence nuclear entanglement are we thinking about these issues probably not so my uh, request over here is that uh, if we don't talk about these issues probably another 5 years or 10 years our future scholars uh, nuclear deterrence would be obsolete as a concept for them so i think uh, whenever we celebrate and with humility and i fully agree we don't have to brandish our nuclear capability we are a confident nuclear power we have managed our nuclear deterrence very well and that's why there is strategic stability in this region but we need to catch on the uh, ongoing debate at the global level at the regional level and educate our next generation of scholars why this nuclear capability was acquired what is their role and what impact emerging or disruptive technologies can have on these capabilities i think that's my request but i'm grateful i was educated by dr answers wonderful presentation as always sir very informative and also kamran sir uh, also uh, because uh, without diplomacy we wouldn't have reached at this uh, occasion uh, where we are now so thank you everyone who all contributed in pakistan nuclear program and thank you for your presentation sir thank you very much sir. well thank you so much dr rajasthan uh, your intervention has reminded me of an anecdote which i will quickly relate barbara walters if you remember was once uh, interviewing henry kissinger and you know that henry kissinger uh, had served president nixon for a very long time and during the interview she shows a clip to henry kissinger in which kiss nixon is saying that kissinger is a crook <laughs> <laughs> he is he's a manipulator he is this he is that and then once the clip ends she asks kissinger how do you respond to that and kissinger says well i could have lived without some of those adjectives <laughs> <laughs> so as a principal i tell you diplomats are averse to adjectives but that said i think you you made your point and what uh, amran sir was saying also had its own value to we'll move on uh, uh, air commodore binuri sahab is with us yes please thank you very much uh, mr chairman my name is khalid binuri um, um like several others um, i have also uh, spent some time um, uh, working for this cause 21 years um, in uh, arms control business at strategic plans division 
I was the first director general of arms control disarmament affairs and the first advisor for arms control and diplomacy. A lot has been said and I do not wish to re uh, be repetitive. And also I would uh, take your advice and keep the emotion uh, away. But he, this is the time uh, to, to kind of acknowledge that passion and commitment was unmatched in this process that, that evolved. It's been 25 years, uh, a lot of learning and a lot of achievement has happened. And some, uh, as we notice um, uh, from some comments, uh, some inevitable unlearning as well. Um, 25 years has been long enough to contribute to solidifying the national pride and the achievements and the capability that we needed. But also um, kind of short enough to note with some satisfaction that there are at least 10 uh, veterans around this table, on the head table, sitting across this side, and perhaps some down there that I'm missing out, more than 10, uh, 10 is a safe figure that I'm giving, uh, who have directly contributed in various ways to uh, in their respective areas, nuclear scientists, engineers, technical leaders, military leaders, um, technologists, diplomats, arms controllers, and some inevitable support of scholars and uh, the ac academia. Um, how this evolved and went ahead, there are several things that have been said. Let me just pick one or two strands about, uh, my favorite line is um, five-pronged strategy that came on nuclear command control, safety, security, dialogue and negotiation and strategic export controls. These were the areas that we had. So I, let me just pick two ideas and we've heard of um, uh, the Director General of IAEA and um, I've had the uh, uh, privilege to um, personally uh, um, uh, be with the DG Amano when he went to our Center of Excellence for Nuclear Security, after which he gave this uh, statement that this is an example in Pakistan, which is for the other countries to emulate. Uh, so several of those ideas that have existed um, that, that came around. Uh, we offered fuel cycle services uh, during the nuclear security uh, uh, summit process. Uh, several things happened. Um, like, like some others uh, around the table, I also agree that while many veterans have been mentioned by name, several others um, were the so-called unsung list. Uh, and in fact, it's not easy to actually um, talk about all of them. Uh, there's so much and some will remain unsung for reasons uh, that we understand for uh, the kind of sensitivities that have. But I would like to um, take the liberty, Mr. Chairman, to say that uh, at the end, I propose that we should do a standing ovation for those who are uh, present and those who have gone south um, for, for all the work that they did. This was monumental work. Um, the newer challenges are now evolving, like the emerging technologies and, and the interface with or the possible interface that can happen with uh, uh, all nuclear technologies. Um, um, I, I would, since I know this side slightly uh, better, uh, I would like to also mention that on the policy side, the living legends like Khalid Kadwai and his team did in initial years, initial 15 years or so, with uh, along with the untiring effort of our diplomats, which was, in my view, nothing less than a miracle. Um, the current teams are now similarly poised to consolidate the newer challenges that are coming around and then and the, or, or the, the ones that are evolving. So uh, one could go on for a long while on these, but let me, let me just say that since much has been said on the peaceful uses, my wish is that by 100 years of Pakistan, by 2047, we have a significant contribution of the nuclear power in the energy security mix. Um, uh, thank you. And may I remind you again about the standing ovation, if possible. Thank you. Most, most certainly, we will certainly do that towards the conclusion. General Lodi here, sir. Please. Thank you very much. I'm retired Lieutenant General Naim Lodi. I think it's a great day that we organized this event uh, to celebrate uh, Yom Takbir. 
um, I will just continue what uh, uh, Adil brought out. Uh, we all understand, uh, Excellency Kamran Saab, that deterrence and diplomacy. Uh, for deterrence, you need uh, capability, uh, the will, and communication. So all three have to be compatible. If, uh, if you have the capability and there's no will to use that capability or to tell the people that we can use it whenever required and also communicate it. My concern is about the communication. Uh, we have the will, we have the capability, all right. Uh, because we, we do not have full diplomatic relations with our adversary. So probably we need to have some special uh, communication arrangements as far as this uh, aspect is concerned. And I may, I may bring to your notice two events, one that uh, misguided Brahmus Mazail, which landed somewhere near Mianchanu. I mean, it is untold. One cannot uh, imagine that uh, a nuclear capable Mazail lands in your country and our uh, response was so muted. Uh, I will not go into the details because of various reasons. And then uh, nowadays, every second day, we are getting threats about the Kashmir that we will take this part of the Kashmir also. So probably some level of will has to be conveyed. Uh, we can be confident, we can have all the wherewithal, but uh, without this communication and without this will, the deterrence uh, doesn't get completed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Ji Bhatsa. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the good words that have been said about the people who worked in the Atomic Energy Commission. I would like to take this opportunity to mention one name for which everything that we have achieved uh, takes who should the name should be given credit, and that is Dr. Ayya Chasman. He was the second chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. He was a scientist par excellence. He was a politician and a scientist combined together civil servant. and a civil servant. I joined the Atomic Energy Commission. I left the army and joined the Atomic Energy Commission because I was influenced by what Dr. Usmani was talking about. He was talking about a great future of Pakistan. And uh, Dr. Usmani uh, founded the Atomic Energy Commission. And the first thing he did the system of management in the Atomic Energy Commission was totally different from the system of management that existed in the government organization. In the government organization, the files move and files are put up and put up, answered. But he introduced a system where professionals were encouraged, professionals were encouraged to set up, uh, talk professionally, and take decisions based on professional advantages. And there are many, many examples that one can quote that he did. So he established a system of management in the Atomic Energy Commission, which we have continued to follow in the Atomic Energy Commission to date. It is very different from a system of management that, for example, exists in the Ministry of Industry. And when he took, Dr. Osmani took this decision, this system introduced the system of management. At that time, Wabda House was built by Wabda people. And they were, Wabda is supposed to set up power stations, all kinds of power stations in the country. The Wabda House was the best building in Lahore at that time. And it is still the best building in <laughs> And Wabda is still importing Chinese and whatnot to do simple things that can be done. But Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission went ahead and established workshops, research centers, basic study centers. So one should uh, uh, not forget the name of Dr. Usmani when it comes to talking about Atomic Energy Commission. I, I just want to say that uh, we talked about uh, making things ourselves. Uh, indigenization is something that has played a great role in the Atomic Energy Commission. We have been, and we continue to supply equipment made in Pakistan to these people who are installing from China, who are installing uh, 
the Chashma nuclear power plant at Karachi nuclear power plant. I was told by some atomic energy commission people, I think up to about 10 or 15 percent of the equipment that is being installed in the new nuclear power power plant uh, are made in, uh, in, in workshops that have been established in Texala and in Karachi and in Islamabad. Uh, and they, these were established by me, incidentally, these workshops. And uh, I we started exporting equipment to some countries. And I would mention that, I think it was the year 2004 or five, that we exported equipment to CERN and CERN in, in Europe gave us the best suppliers award. We, came, we were the best suppliers of award, got the best suppliers award for supplying equipment made in Pakistan and supplied to them and it is installed in CERN. So that's the, I wanted to highlight. Dr. Osmani, an export of equipment. Uh, just one sentence, one sentence, please, sir. If you allow me. The strength of the Atomic Energy Commission lay in the diversity of its people. All kinds of activities were possible because these people existed, and therefore, in spite of the U.S. and other sanctions, we, we were able to undertake this route. Thank you so much. We have just just a, a time for just one question because I think we are already oh. short. Yes. Right, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Jaren Nasir. Uh, I have the honor of serving in uh, Strategic Plans Division for uh, four years as the uh, Director General Operations and Plans. And uh, ever since, I'm also serving as the advisor to SPD. Uh, would like to just, uh, since it is Yomit Akbir and it is about the manifestation of the capability, which is the uh, the very much the, the foundation of the survival of Pakistan, despite all kind of uh, threats that we have. I think uh, Adil and uh, then Lodi, one my colleague and the other my mentor, uh, what they have said uh, needs to be reiterated today. Uh, so I would uh, like to go with them what they have said. Uh, I would just uh, convey two or three short points, which uh, I think are very pertinent. In the academic circles today in Pakistan and abroad, there is a debate whereby the younger generation is being swayed intellectually that uh, nuclear pessimism is the, the key. And uh, it, uh, the resort to the use of nuclear weapons or even the talk of that, that is something which is uh, a taboo. I think in Pakistan, uh, we are absolutely clear that it is the nuclear capability which is the guarantor of our national security and defense. So I personally feel that uh, there is very little room or absolutely no room for uh, nuclear pessimism in Pakistan. We should actually be promoting the nuclear optimism. So this is uh, what I want to highlight. Uh, secondly, having achieved so much, mashallah, where we are paying tributes to our heroes, uh, there is also a need to remain uh, abreast with the challenges that uh, those are coming up. So whereas the first, dec first uh, the 25 years and the second 25 years are full of uh, the achievements, I think the challenges which are coming in front of us because of the changing uh, geostrategic environment, uh, I think uh, they also pose many challenges to our nuclear program. So we need to remain uh, aware of what is happening. So that is uh, important just uh, end at that. But uh, Kam Kamran has said something which is uh, increasingly important. That is the intelligence cooperation. Uh, we have witnessed, we have been colleagues, we have been rubbing our shoulders on every occasion that uh, whenever there was a problem, so I think uh, this thing has to be promoted uh, besides the national consensus about this capability. This has always remained, mashallah, beyond any debate. And I pray and uh, uh, only plead that uh, this should be preserved. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think we can all take great relief and uh, confidence in the fact that this program enjoys the greatest 
national consensus, which has always been the case, as inshallah will remain always the case. And we know that how the nation feels pride in possession of this and remains a protector of this program. And I think uh, the points that you have raised, or Dr. Adil and then uh, Lodi, uh, they were very well addressed by no less an authority than General Kidwai himself. And you saw that he spoke in great detail. And whoever would pay greater attention would know what he was communicating, I think, in very clear, categoric, and unambiguous terms about the military dimensions of the program as well. That said, would, Mr. Daman, would you like to add something? Yes. Just with reference to some of the comments, uh, I, I think um, I understand there is no confusion, but I would like to once again reiterate that I have already stressed that we are not apologetic about our capability. We are on the right side of legality. We have principled underpinnings of our positions. And that has enabled Pakistani diplomats to withstand a lot of pressure. And that has enabled us to work with confidence at the international fora, where even if we are alone, we block something which is not in our interest. But beyond that, conveying uh, the will to uh, have uh, some uh, the will to have the resolve to respond to any attack, I think that is best conveyed through action. And we don't need to reiterate that through words because I think the strongest communication of will is poise. We should maintain our poise as a confident state. And that is the strongest means of conveying it. As for actions, we saw what happened in Balakot in 2019. <clears throat> we were not found wanting in terms of our resolve to respond to any threat to our uh, national security. So I think uh, there is agreement on that, and uh, there uh, there is no uh, uh, no apologetic attitude towards the nuclear capability. Thank you. Thank you. So just last word, the Admiral Said, sir. So thank you very much for giving me time. Uh, first of all, so very kind for inviting me over on this very important day. Uh, I think I would have missed if I wouldn't have been here today. And uh, this is a kind of story that we all have shared with that it's a, a total dedication, devotion, and consistency on all those who are involved into it. That is a success story. Uh, diplomacy and diplomats contributed their part. One of the area which was highlighted by Mr. Kamran, that signing of NPT was a critical issue on that our diplomacy had great wisdom. Why not to sign it? Uh, that is one part. But uh, further going ahead with what we are faced with today, uh, we talked about our urge to get into the nuclear surprise group. Uh, sir, a small question which you did talk about that we should avoid our uh, loud uh, expressions on that, number one. Number two, avoiding adjectives also. But besides that, can you give us a little light on that? Is it more in the technical side or now it is more into the diplomacy side that we are facing some uh, impediments? Uh, this is question number one. And question number two is towards the uh, eminent speaker, Saran sir. Sir, recently we had, about a week ago, we uh, had a, a pact with Iran where we got about 100 megawatt of uh, electricity from there. So our future and what developments is coming up into Gwadar area and exclusive economic zone and in industrial hub all together. Uh, in our vision, are we planning to have some nuclear capability uh, power plants to be installed in that area? Because currently we do have only in uh, Kenap area and the Cheshma area. So that is regarding the vision we are talking about because otherwise we'll have to install a lot of long lines to uh, get this energy into that area. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If I could ask to, to be very brief in the response here, Kaman Sahib and then Dr. Sahib. Well, in, in terms of meeting the technical requirements of NSC, we are almost there because uh, because uh, the admission criteria of the NSC we meet on account of uh, being a capable supplier state 
on account of nuclear safety and security on account of our commitment to the non proliferation standards and norms so we are there it is about politics and it is about economy as well indians were given exemption to the 2008 nsg uh, nsg exemption to the guidelines because they were projecting a potential market in 2008 of 100 billion dollars for nuclear supplies from the western countries when we have that kind of economic strength i think the people will come rushing to us so it's it's all about politics and economy and that is why i stress the need for whole of the government and whole of the system approach because till the time we don't have our own house in order it will be very difficult to achieve any of the foreign policy objectives not just the nsg so we, we've got to have our house in order and uh, secondly once we move into the business of nuclear supplies more confidently hitherto we have been very hesitant but now we are promoting the export of services and items and we've uh, in the recent years exported many of uh, the dual use items which are on the control list once we do that i think it will be a matter of time because it will be the determination of the members of the export control regimes that it's better to have pakistan inside rather than outside and doing a nuclear commerce thank you so much yeah, hey, Doctor, i think very uh, briefly kind of... small medium modular reactor that kamran saab talked about this could be one possibility once these are available. Uh, but one thing uh, we must realize that for a nuclear power plant to be established at some place, there must be a supply of electricity to it also to meet the safety requirement in case of an accident. So there you will still have to lay down the lines, but then the power that is required locally could be uh, ultimately produced locally. Thank you. I think that uh, I know that there are several people still wanting to speak, but we have already overshot uh, our time uh, by a big margin, so I will uh, return it back to Amna. But thank you so much for all your contributions, very insightful questions and very rich answers. Thank you so much, sir. I would now request Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, M Chairman Board of Governors, Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, for his concluding remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Director General ISSI. Ambassador Sohail Mahmood, distinguished uh, speakers at the seminar, Lieutenant yeah. General Khaled Kidwai, Dr. Yeah. Ansar Parvez, and Mr. Muhammad Kamran Akhtar. Ambassador Sohail Mahmood rightly said that May 28, 1998, was a consequential day for Pakistan. On that day, Pakistan, by becoming overtly nuclear, restored the strategic balance which had been disturbed by Indian nuclear testing a few days earlier. We have learned from speakers, the whole saga of uh, nuclearization of South Asia. And it has rightly been said that we should acknowledge the contribution of the strategic scientific community in making Pakistan a nuclear power. And many omissions have been pointed out. I also want to point out <laughs> another one. That throughout all this process, the government had appointed an apex committee to facilitate this project. It, it consisted of three persons. Mr. Gulam Isar Khan, Mr. Agha Shahi, and Mr. A.G.N. Kazi. They were the apex committee which overlooked the whole process. And when we are acknowledging uh, the contribution of others, 
of which three are sitting, three, four are sitting here. Mr. Bhatt Saab, Mr. Tarveh Saab, and Shokat Amit Saab. Uh, we should remember the leadership provided by that ethics committee also. Now, many points have been, all pertinent points have been addressed. I would touch only two more points. Mm -hmm. One, that the discriminatory treatment which Pakistan has been subjected to uh, ever since Pakistan embarked on this uh, journey of nuclearization. First of all, Pakistan was a reluctant nuclear power. We did not want the South Asia to get nuclearized. We made many proposals to India to keep this area free from nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, India refused all these proposals, rejected all these proposals. And uh, first in 1974, as you know, it uh, tested peaceful <laughs> nuclear explosion, which they claimed. And then in 1998, they became over nuclear power. So, but the reaction of uh, the international community that really was surprising and in fact painful. That in 1974, instead of punishing the culprit, the sanctions were imposed on against Pakistan. And second time in 98, both India and Pakistan were subjected to sanctions, but then waiver was given to India. And so all efforts were aimed at capping, undermining the Pakistan's nuclear capability. And same situation we are facing now at the nuclear suppliers group membership. But we remain undeterred and uh, uh, keep pursuing what is in our national interest. Secondly, I want also at this moment to acknowledge the support which we received from our friendly countries. On May 28, 98, I was in Jeddah. I was at that time ambassador to Saudi Arabia. A delegation from Pakistan was to come, Amayu Akhtar, Minister of Investment. And suddenly we received information that that visit has been called off. So I was surprised, you know, we have made so much arrangements for meeting of them with investors and this and that. When I put from Riyadh, I reached Jeddah and went to the hotel put on the television and I learned that Pakistan has tested him. But then I realized why this meeting has been called off. Anticipating that some instructions will be coming from the foreign ministry, I requested a meeting with immediately with the king and the crown prince both. I was told first you go through the foreign ministry request, you know. And second, it is the weekend. Thirdly, the king is ailing. It's difficult to receive him. I said, please put in my request. And lo and behold, after half an hour, I got reply that the king will receive you tomorrow. Ailing king who do doesn't meet anyone. And next day, with great fanfare, you know, I was taken to the king at some palace. And on a Friday, complete silence there, you know, 
king, old king sitting in one room to receive Pakistani embassy. So by that time I had received the instruction from the foreign minister. So I explained to the king why we have done this. No, his reply was very simple. He said, Mr. Ambassador, what you have done, we are against it because we are members of NPT. But we know why you have done it. Your security imperative. And we assure you that we will help you more than what you expect of us. Next day, Crown Prince received you, who was running the government here, and longer meeting. His reply also the same. We are against what you have done, but we know why you have done it. And we will help you more than what you expect of us. And the rest is the history, you know, the oil supplies and the you know, security will be good. But after some time, I happened to meet again the Crown Prince. He said, Mr. Ambassador, I am receiving phones from President Clinton. He's saying, what you are doing? We are sanctioning Pakistan and you are undercutting our sanctions. He said, I told him, we have a different nature of relationship with Pakistan. For Saudi Arabia to say this to the United States means That's something. Good. So we, while we are celebrating this occasion, we should also remember the while opposition of the Western world, but also the support of our friendly countries. Uh, General Nasir has uh, rightly pointed out that we should not rest on our oaths. That uh, of course we have achieved a lot. But now new challenges are coming. Not only the changing geopolitical situation, but also new technologies, you know, disruptive new technology, which might negate all the advantage which we have achieved. So we have to be very up to date with all these developments. And I'm sure, uh, uh, like as in the past, our uh, nation can rise up to this occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now request all of you to please give a standing ovation to all those who contributed to the nuclear program of Pakistan. I would now request Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Chairman, Board of Governors, Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, to give ISSI mementos to panelists. First, I would request Dr. Ansar Pervez to receive his memento. <laughs> 